Hello? All right, it should work. Hmm? The clicker doesn't work. Yep. Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dobloi Utro. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> uh, Moscow. <laughs> Moscow. Anyway, hello, Moscow. Uh, welcome to the Ruby Conference 2016. Oh, right? No. No. Uh, Rails Club. <laughs> uh, this is Rails Club. Uh, I haven't had any Rails conferences. I have, I have never. So, and I probably I will not. <laughs> so the Rails crop is an exception. <laughs> uh, there are a few reasons. So the, how, I don't know why, but you guys in, in Russia don't organize the RubyConf. <laughs> But I wanted to be here. And then the organizers that invited me for years, so they finally persuaded me to be here. And thank you. Uh, as you know, the rare is not equal to Ruby. Yeah. And I confess, I'm not a web guy. Uh, I don't program in new Rails. I do Ruby. Actually, I design Ruby, and I've implemented Ruby. So, fundamentally, I am a C programmer. <laughs> I spend most time in C. But, uh, you know, I, I don't do web, any web, web stuff. And uh, Rails is designed by the guy, the DHH, the David Heinemeyer, Hansen. Yeah, probably right. And uh, Ruby is designed by me, Matt, and my name is Yukihiro Matsumoto, or say in Japanese accent, Matsumoto Yukihiro. Can you say that? <laughs> Matsumoto Yukihiro. Yeah. Anyway, so let me talk about the history. The back in 1980, so that's when most of us don't be on the, on the earth. You, you haven't born yet. But you know, I started programming back then in basic, in a, on a pocket computers like this. <laughs> yeah, this is, back then, this is the only computer uh, affordable for me. So, and then the basic on this computer was pretty much limited. So, so limited programming language. Just because, you know, only one little variables are allowed. So that means only we can six, 26 global variables. If, you, if uh, the basic was in Russian, you can use uh, 33 variables. But, uh, we, we, can, we could use, I could use only the English alphabet, so only 26 global variables. So, and then only 1,400 steps. In, in other words, 140, uh, 400 lines of code in maximum. So, this is so limited. So, I was struggling with the language itself, other than the, the task I have to uh, we, I wanted to solve, like uh, writing games in, in 140 lines and writing some kind of calculation in this limited memory. So it's kind of difficult. So I struggled with the language. Then the few years later, I was interested in the programming language itself. So I struggled with the languages so, that, that, so tough, so frequently, 
So I interested in programming languages in general. So I started learning uh, about uh, the languages out of the world, uh, in the world. So, but uh, back then, I only had uh, this teeny computer, so I cannot write programs for, for these comp uh, programs. And it, is, it is quite difficult to obtain the compiler for those languages, like uh, the Pascal, Lisp, Ada, Smalltalk. You know, the I can buy uh, the computer that can run Pascal compiler for, I don't know, 2,000, uh, 2000 US dollar, and the compiler itself costed to extra $2,000. So it's not affordable for high school students. So only I, can do, I could do was a, so reading books and studying programming language. So luckily, it is possible to write programs on a sheet of papers. <laughs> so back then, I started writing programs on the notebooks. Then, these languages are designed by human, right? So Pascal was a guy who named Nicholas Welt, and then the other programming language was designed by other people. So these languages are not given. Like, a, you know, no one designed Russian, right? No one designed Japanese language. But uh, you know, these programming languages are designed by a specific human in recent time. They are still alive. Most of them are still alive. Oh, John McCarthy was dead. <laughs> anyway, uh, so back then, in the 80s, I thought, why not me? So if the people out there could design their own programming languages. So I'm pretty interested in programming language and in the design of programming language. So why not me? Why couldn't I design my own programming language? So, but I, I didn't have any computers, so I took my notebook and I write down the programs in my dream programming language. Yeah. That's, that's so pity I lost that notebook. <laughs> so I, uh, but back then, I didn't have computers, I didn't have knowledge, I, I didn't, we didn't have internet back then. So it was me a dream, only a dream. So if I could design programming language, it would be so nice. And I entered in university, majored in computer science, and graduated from the university. Then I started working as a programmer in 1993. So in early 90s, in Japan, the bubble economy was crushed. So we had very deep depression, economical depression. So my project was canceled. But luckily, I wasn't fired. So I was left in the uh, project to maintain the you know, the leftover software that created by the council project. And then, actually, I didn't have anything to do. So I sit on the, in front of the desk. The computer was on the desk. I have plenty of time. So I started my pet project on the computer, which gradually going into Ruby. So in that year, 1993, so Ruby was born. So the two years later, 1995, I put it on the internet. So the, this is the way we had the Ruby in the world. So the officially Ruby's birthday is the uh, February 24th, 1993, which I named it Ruby. On the day I named it Ruby, but uh, I released it on the internet on the December 21st, 1995. So in, uh, in one definition of the birthday of the language, the Ruby's birthday is uh, uh, December 21st, 1995. So since then, Ruby gradually getting popular bit by bit, especially in Japan. 
But uh, you know, the, there are tons of programming languages out there. So maybe thousands of programming languages on the, in the world. And uh, most of them, so stays few years, like four years, five years, then they gradually disappeared. So I expected Ruby is went like this. Ruby would like go like this. So the you know Ruby is getting popular and got get uh, maybe a few hundred users on the internet and then a few years later they it, it gradually disappears in the history of the internet. But that didn't happen that like like that. In year two thousand so the guy named Dave Thomas and Andy Hunt came in and wrote a book on the newly coming programming language named Ruby. So it, it was the, uh, ta uh, nicknamed by the Peacock books. And it, it, by this book, so, so many people got interested in my programming language. And then next year, we got first international Ruby conference held in the Tampa, Florida. Uh, the attendee was 35 person, people, <laughs> only 35. But uh, the highlight of the, this year is not this conference. But uh, a few months earlier, we had, we had a conference named the JAOO. That stands for Java and Object Oriented Programming. So JAO held in off Denmark. I was invited in, in the dot conferences to introduce the new programming language named Ruby. Yeah, it was new back then. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was a great conference, Java and object oriented and the programming languages. And uh, I met with a student volunteer from Denmark and who was a PHP programmer. And whose name is David Heinemann <laughs> And a few years later, he built up that application named the Basecamp in Ruby, and uh, he ripped off the, the fundamental part of the, the, the application into the framework that, that names Ruby on Rails. So the framework that changed the world. So the Ruby on Rails became so popular, and the people who use Rails use Ruby. So that makes Ruby pretty popular among the web, web application world, even though I'm not a web guy. <laughs> so the fundamental principle in Rails is a COC, dry, and all my concept. And then COC stands for the Convention Over Configuration. Maybe you, you knew better, you know, better about this. And then the proper default, by providing proper default setting, so co that covers 80% of, well, so you don't have to worry about the huge XML configuration file or anything like that. That is so revolutionary back then, 2004. And so you running on a truck or you follow the rails way, so you will be happy and very productive. That is called COC. And dry stands for the don't repeat yourself. So that means be conscious. The succinctness itself is a power. So the, in the history of programming language, more than 60 years of history of the programming language, so the, the software expressiveness is getting bigger and bigger, so the software become more and more and more and more succinct. So succinctness itself is the power. That's what the, the, the program says. And then the longer code drains your brain power. So the, your code, your application should be as succinct as possible. So the one way is writing DSL, domain specific language. So the DSL provides a high abstraction, self-documenting documenting code and validation at the domain level and productivity, reliability, maintainability, portability, and reusability. Oh, I can say that. <laughs> uh, Rails itself is a DSL. 
that that's that may sound a little bit weird, but uh, the, think about that. So the, the Rails itself is a DSL in the the base camp web application. So the DHH created DSL for his web application and ripped off this DSL into web framework. So the Dave Thomas once said the programming is, is a process of designing your own DSL for your application. So, so the DSL, uh, so the, you are writing DSL for your application. So when you writing uh, web application, so the domain specific language is itself is a, a DSL. So the providing DSL uh, by adding domain specific vocabulary like uh, active support. So I didn't design this kind of lines <laughs> two days ago. Yeah, that is astonishing for them, for me. So, and then by adding domain specific structure like active record, like active record itself is a the, you know the sub DSL in the in Rails that could access or retrieve the data from database. So the the Rails itself is a set of DSLs to, for web applications. Then that is in, that is enabled by the meta programming which is uh, Ruby inherited from the previous languages like us, Lisp and Smalltalk. And then in addition, the Rails is omakase. Do you, does, is any one of you understand the, the word omakase is? No, no, the omakase is Japanese. Then right, like this, omakase. So omakase is, fundamentally means the chef's choice, especially in sushi restaurant. So instead of making choice by you, the chef make decision by many factors like uh, you know we the fish the restaurant has or the maybe the, the your your, fav, uh, your preference or any, any many other factors. The chef made decision, so you don't have to make decision. So you can only uh, you only enjoy the sushi. So that means the Rails is pretty much opinionated. opinionated. Like, a, so you follow the Rails way, so you will be happy. So using Rails is following DHS's opinion, right? So DHS is a person who is pretty much opinionated for development of web applications. Yeah, he's a very strong, strong person. Yeah, unlike me. <laughs> but the, his opinion is influenced by Ruby, the language, by the meta, meta programming or maybe the, the design principle behind Ruby. And then that language was designed by me. So in other words, the I influence you, right? Yeah. So the, the, the basic principle behind Ruby is the, those, the so productivity. I want to provide productivity for programmers or in other words, development efficiency, not the runtime efficiency, but the development efficiency. And uh, you, I want you to be happy and uh, I want to focus on humans, not machines. So, for example, Ruby is an object-oriented programming language. And uh, it is dynamic typing. Unlike Java or Scala or maybe other programming languages, those programming languages are statically typed. So the, all the variables, all the expressions are typed in, stat in compile time. But the Ruby is dynamic typing. Or in other words, it's dark typing. Maybe you know about the dark typing. So if it works like a duck, the quarks like a duck, we assume it is a duck, right? So it does duck typing. So the, not this duck typing. 
but this duck typing. <laughs> so it quacks like a duck. It is a duck. <laughs> it walks like a duck. It is a duck, right? I don't care about the internal. I don't care about the, you know, slight difference. So we can assume it is a duck. This is a fundamental concept of duck typing. Then that is essential of the object oriented programming. So we do not classify by classes. So like animal, mammal, human, or something like that. This is bad example of object-oriented programming. We do not check types. So just ask, do this, do that. And it is capable, if it is capable to, uh, to the, act like a, as asked, so we assume it is a duck. So we don't care about intelligence. We don't care about structure. So we just care how it behaves. So we can ignore inside detail. That is the very fundamental concept of object-oriented programming. So, so ask computer to dispatch. So internally, so we have to, to dispatch. So this is a string. We have to care about the, the string class uh, structure. So we dispatch this and this and that. Well, no, oh, oh, if this is an array instead of a string, so we have to handle the, this as an array or something like that. But uh, we, we don't want to care about those. So we just want to ask, so retrieve first element from this object, no matter what structure it is. So, so we don't have, so that basic concept is we don't have to work on that. So let computer work for you. So don't work too hard. Be lazy. <laughs> the, the fundamental principle behind dark typing is become lazy. Dry. Yeah, dry is a very famous principle. Don't repeat yourself. So avoid duplicates, avoid redundancy, but uh, and uh, avoid copy and paste because it's bad. Why bad? Because you spread bags all over. Beside that, we are lazy. <laughs> so we are too lazy to main, maintain duplicates. So the we encourages being dry just because we are lazy. We want to be lazy. We are very eager to become lazy. <laughs> so in summary, those principles, very important principles in, in behind Ruby, dark typing and dry, the, it is for encouraging the spirit of laziness. So the, when I met Larry Wall, who invented pro programming language. So he told me the three virtues of great programmers. So if you want to be a great programmer, so you want to uh, enc encourage those three great virtues. Those are laziness, impatience, and hubris. The laziness means, oh, too long. <laughs> The quality that makes you go to great effort to resolve, reduce overall energy expenditure. It makes you write labor-saving programs that other people will find useful and document what you wrote so that you don't have to answer so many questions about it. So that's the laziness. The impatience. The anger you feel when the computer is being lazy. So we want to be lazy. I don't want computer to be lazy. So this makes you write programs that don't just react to your needs, but actually anticipate them, or at least pretend to. The hubris. 
the quality that makes you write and maintain programs that the other uh, people won't want, want to say bad things about it. And, then, and he said, laziness is the most important virtue. So be lazy. We should not work too hard. We, we have to be lazy. We have to enjoy what to do. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, reason behind enjoy programming. So that the biggest obstacle is our psychological tendency, which we call alpha syndrome. Have you ever heard of the alpha syndrome? Maybe not. So computers are great. Uh, never, they, they are never be tired, never be bored. They are fast. We can be more productive when we work with computers, right? So computers are great. But, so we have to be aware of alpha syndrome. Alpha is a group, a leader of a group. Uh, have you ever seen the Jurassic World? Yeah, we had some kind of Velociraptor, the four Velociraptor, three or four, I don't remember the number, the four Velociraptor, the alpha, beta, gamma, or something like that. So alpha is a leader of a group. So if you control the alpha, you can uh, control the entire group. So in the, some kind of animals, like a dogs and the Velociraptor, so we, they have some kind of order of a hierarchy. So the alpha controls the group, right? So imagine your pet, pet dog, like this. This is my dog. So you pet it, you work for it, you do everything for you can do for it. And then it gradually started feeling, oh, they are so nice. They treat me as a king. So I must be an alpha. <laughs> so it starts to behave bad. So I'm alpha, so you obey. <laughs> so that's alpha syndrome. And then, so the, I'm talking about the computers. Computers, they are efficient, but they are not perfect. They are far from perfect. You have to care about them. You have to work for them. You start to pay effort for them. Then we, we gradually think about their alpha. So you are gradually become their slaves. So the computers, uh, we have to care about computers so much. We have to nurse, nurse computers so much. So we uh, what? I don't remember the word. Wait. We have to pay uh, our effort so much for computers. So they, we, we gradually think about the, we do everything for computers. That's kind of alpha syndrome, or maybe reverse alpha syndrome. So be tr treating computers as our alpha, so we and unconsciously think us about a non-alpha or beta or something. So you, we unconsciously uh, become a slaves of computers. So remember, you are the masters. So don't work too hard. Don't work. Be lazy. So let computers work for you. So the, maybe you don't know, but uh, there are some words named the karoshi. Have you ever heard of that? The, the karoshi is from Japanese, like sukiyaki or something like that. But uh, this is very bad words. The karoshi is death by working too hard. Yeah. <laughs> the, in J Japanese people, has very long tradition of the diligent work, but uh, it has very heavy side effect. We work too hard, 
And uh, you know, working too hard is prioritized so high, so that we see uh, being productive. Uh, that we we do not emphasize being productive. So we uh, very tend to be like a uh, work too hard without being productive. So we spend hours in the office. So some people live in the office. So, and uh, this is not exceptional, unfortunately. So last week in Japanese news, uh, the young lady died, that, that killed kill herself last year for working too hard in a company. And then, so that news uh, stimulated the people so much, and uh, that we have uh, some other reports that, uh, we, that this person has died, killed himself by working too hard. This guy by, killed, uh, was uh, killed by illness, but uh, mostly due to the working too hard, something like that. So this is very bad tradition in our country. But, uh, you know, Japanese is not special. So we have some kind of a tendency or t in like that. So we often work too hard. That's not good. That's not good. We have to uh, eliminate Kaloshi from the world, from the, from the programming world at least. So don't work too hard. Remember Ruby principles, the productivity, development efficiency, the programming happiness, focusing on humans. Uh, so those are, those are the principles that makes us less work be productive, enjoy programming. So avoid karoshi. So don't work too hard. And then to be productive, we need more power to make us happy programmers, to avoid hard working, to avoid alpha syndrome. We need more power. The Ruby rails give you power. That's our, our ultimate goal. Our core teams, the Ruby core teams, working very, very hard to make Ruby more productive, efficient, and a better programming language to make you productive, make you work less, and then make you happy. So empowering programmers, that is our ultimate goal. The, the, the Ruby core team, design programming language, implement programming language, improve programming language to make you better programmer, empower you. So that I trust you, so the great power comes with great responsibility as uh, uncle, <laughs> the, the Spider-Man's Spider uncle said. So I trust you, you you will do great works if you got power. So more power to programmers. I want to deliver more power to programmers. So that's the fundamental design principle behind Ruby. And then I believe, actually, I haven't talked much with this uh, topic with the DHH in before. So that's my, only my estimate. But uh, I believe he agreed with you. Uh, agree with me, I mean. He agreed with me. He wanted to empower you, I assume. And then, then with that power, that kind of power, you can be more productive, you can be more happy, and then you will bring world great things using that power from Ruby and Rails. So power from, using power from computers, you can do anything. You can make the world a better place. So I, ask, I trust you, you can make uh, things and the people, a world, a better place to live. Uh, I, 
and then happy hacking. <laughs> Наверняка есть вопросы. Спасибо. So. Um, uh, very much thank you for you. Um, very much thank you for the Ruby language. Uh, it really makes happy. Uh, it really makes me happy, and I think all of us. Uh, so thank you again. And the question, uh, can you tell us uh, some words about MRuby work? Yes. Uh, MRuby. So I confess that I haven't uh, worked as a programmer for CRuby for a long time. So we have the very uh, smarter people in Ruby core team, so I don't have to work on the C programmer for CRuby. But uh, I have other pet projects named MRuby. Uh, MRuby is an alternative implementation of Ruby, Ruby language. And it's smaller, it's, uh, it has a smaller foot memory footprint, and it, uh, it has the embeddable uh, C API. So, and uh, it is a subset of the, the Ruby language, as a library-wise. The syntax-wise, it is fully compatible with 1.9, at least. And uh, so, some people already use uh, MRuby in their productions. Like, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the company, but uh, some company in Brazil uh, embed MRuby in their, the, the credit card payment machine. So that recognized uh, every credit card, every debit card, even bitcoins. So that program is written in MRuby, embedded in this size of the, the credit payment machines. The other companies, say, back in Japan, is working on uh, embed MRuby in the internet router. The, or maybe some other guys embed MRuby in vending machines, or maybe in microsatellites, like a satellite of this big, the, orbit, orbit, uh, the flying orbits for a year or two. And then, they are working very diligently to, to make embedding programming better and more productive. So, and then you can uh, check out the MRuby source code from uh, GitHub MRuby slash MLB. Uh, did I answer your question? Um, thank you for your presentation, and I, I, don't, I, I want to say sorry about my English, but actually the question... Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. Um, not so far uh, was um, a presentation of new concurrency model in Ruby called Guilds, and can you say about a couple of words when we, maybe in dates, uh, we can try this in our home project or maybe, maybe some brief... Uh, guys can try it in the production already because I think that's a really a big, you know, a big step forward for Ruby. Yep. We're all waiting for this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the, the concurrency is the, the one of the three, four, uh, the goals of the, the new coming major version of Ruby named Ruby 3. And then one is concurrency, the other one is the, the some kind of the Compile time, time type checking, and the other one is the performance. The, for concurrency, we have tried many things in the in the past. Like uh, I gave a presentation in Euroco last year, and for the concurrency. But uh, and, uh, in the core team, we discussed very heavily about the making the the suitable. Uh, Ruby con future Ruby concurrency. Just because you know, we currently we have threads for concurrency, concurrent programming, but uh, our threads requires the global interpreter lock, which uh, limit only one thread at a time runs in the virtual machine. 
just because you know the virtual machine itself is not really a thread safe, and it is very difficult to make it the real thread safe for the virtual machine in C. And uh, unlike JRuby, JRuby, which is Java, is a fundamentally concurrent programming language, so you can have the concurrent data structure built in to the language. But uh, C is not the language like that. And then, and then if you access one object from many threads, you, have, you will see the, some kind of the inconsistency even in JRuby. So I don't, I don't want the, to do like that. So the, I want some kind of the, the more higher abstraction from Coconut C. So after the heavy discussion, in, in, within the, the Ruby core team, so we recently proposed the, the potential uh, the, the me mechanisms for uh, the Ruby three concurrency, which is named the Guild, Guild, not the Gil, G I L, Guild, <laughs> and then Guild is a the organization with a membership. So any object belong to one Guild at a time. So you can transfer one guild to another guild. So that means the, uh, in reality, you can void the, this object. And then you can enable the copy of the shallow copy of that object in the different guild. So you can access only one object at a time from, a, from one guild. So you can you don't share object among guilds. In, so that means, so you, you don't have to worry about the shared state the, um, the between guilds. So the, the Koichi Sasada, which, who came here last year, and uh, who is the, the guy behind the idea of guild, and uh, who named it guild, <laughs> and uh, he, now experimenting it very heavily in his C programs. And then he has, he has prototype, and he's measuring his effort. And then he's, I believe he's working okay. So the time frame, yeah, that's a great question. The, I don't know the time frame, just because we have the, so many uncertainty, so, so ambiguity in the, the, the behavior, specification, or many things. But I estimate, only estimation, only I estimate, so we will see gills in Ruby in two, five or two, six. That means next year or two years later. So, and then, so you have to wait at least a year, or maybe two. So uh, let me explain a little bit more about that, releasing. So we release uh, the minor version of Ruby, uh, C Ruby, uh, once every year in December. So we will have the 2.4 in coming December, Christmas, and the 2.5 in next year. And then we, will incrementally integrate the two uh, Ruby 3 uh, features like Gills into the Ruby 2x. 2, 2 so we will, if once we uh, implement it and success, successfully implement uh, the guild, so we will uh, introduce it in Ruby 2, 5, 2, 6 or something like that. So you don't have to wait until the official release of Ruby 3. So. That's what I can say now. <laughs> Вопрос. Hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was great. And um, I have a very short question. Uh, what do you think about uh, statical typing in Ruby? Like in Java, for example. Uh, Thank you. I'm not against the static typing. So I'm not, you know, the, but uh, 
I, I like some uh, static uh, types of programming language. On a, on a, when I was in university, I even designed statically typed object oriented programming language in the university. So I'm not, the, but uh, you know, the integrating or adding static typing to Ruby is pretty tough thing just because you know, Ruby just works without any type annotations. So I'm heavily strongly against adding optional uh, type notation to Ruby. But instead, I want to add some kind of that, uh, uh, what am I saying? Right. The extensive uh, compile time type inferences system named duck inferencing. That is the very big topic in the keynote in the RubyConf <laughs> next month. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your speech, and uh, thank you for your Ruby. Um, I have a question about backward compatibility and more important about forward compatibility. Uh, because, um, for example, uh, projects what were made on Rails 2 uh, uh, not always uh, may work on recent Ruby versions. What's your opinion on that? So we, we very care about the compatibility. So we once had a big issue between 1.8 and 1.9, just because we replaced the virtual machines and the, the language system, uh, that mean the string systems. So we had a, uh, the huge compatibility gap between 1.8 and 1.9. And the other language, like a Python, had a huge compatibility gap between uh, Python 2 and Python 3. And uh, that makes language evolution very slow. Because you know, the, we had five-year latency in the migration from 1.8 to 1.9, and the, in Python community, they have the more than 10 years, or maybe um, yeah, 10, 10 years latency in the in the migration to from Ruby 2. I mean Python 2 from Python 3. So I don't want that kind of the the moratorium or the maybe the uh, you know latency in the communi uh, community. So the Ruby 3, even the Ruby 3 is a major release. But uh, I will uh, I will try to make the compatibility gap at, as small as possible. So I expect the 90, say, 5 to 98 percent of your program will run without any modification in Ruby 3. Thank you for one of the best languages in the world. And uh, what about some words uh, about new garbage collection model and algorithm in next Ruby release? Uh, the garbage collection. The garbage collection has been improved uh, uh, heavily in since Ruby one uh, two o. I mean, so the you know if you any of you running uh, your application in Ruby two say two o. So just replacing Ruby 2.3 will gain uh, maybe 10 to 15 percent in performance improvement just by replacing the virtual machine. So the, due to the, the garbage collection improvement. So the, the, the huge garbage collection improvement is not planned for Ruby 3, but the, uh, the, we will introduce guilds, so the, 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 we will improve the, the garbage collector work well with guilds so that so you can only collect uh, the object and the per guilds, uh, per, per guilds so, so that you can reduce the scope of the garbage collection. 
So, so you may have, you may or may not uh, have the, uh, will see the improvement in garbage collection.